Good morning. Would you please open your Bibles this morning to the book of Luke? Scripture reading this morning would be Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to them, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift up they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, It says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Thank you, Phil. Well, it's great to see everybody today and being able to worship God. What a great thing to uh, get to see all of your smiling masks. That's about the best we've got, isn't it? So lots of things happening right now. Uh, We are going to be talking about Satan today. and What does it mean to be able to deal with the devil? This is something we need to do, something that's important. There's one of the things that we have been talking about just recently, and the elders and everybody has, all the ministers have gotten together to talk about kind of a theme for this year. And so as we've been talking about a theme for this year, we came upon conforming to the heart of Christ. And so I think Josh was the one that came up with that, and... uh, That seems like a good thing for us to be able to focus on this year, is that we're going to be conforming to the heart of Christ and to what that really means. Um, It's taking a look at Jesus and what Jesus goes through, about how Jesus trains people, about how we can become what Jesus was wanting people to be. There's a passage in Romans 8, 28 that we all know that talks about how we Know that those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. And we want to claim that part, but the part after that, it's for those who foreknew He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. And that's really what it's about, is this idea of being able to be conformed to the image of His Son. And so that's what kind of what we want to address this year and be able to think about it as far as what goes on. Um, So I think it's important for us to be able to look at Scripture and look at what Jesus did and take that serious. I think sometimes we read the Scripture and go, oh, yeah, I know that. We're going to do temptations again. It's Luke chapter 4. Great job, Phil, reading that. Great job being able to express that. Here's a situation where Jesus was, and yeah, we've done this before, so we can all just kind of relax, right? 
What did you think of this week? It's kind of a mess this week, isn't it? And a lot happened this week, and I find myself shocked at some of the things that happened. I never expected that people would act this way. Uh, I think it's amazing how social media gets used against us. And when we thought we're saying something that would be nice, and it doesn't matter which side you're on, somebody else is going to disagree with you, and they're not going to like you for what you said. How did we get that? And I don't know that I can make any more sense out of it than the rest of you. I know violence gets misused. I want you to know I'm not ignoring it. I just don't have anything that'll fix it. And when I don't have a solution that'll fix it, I'm going to let somebody else come up with a solution that'll fix it. And so I found one passage that perhaps describes the best way of looking at this, and this is Proverbs 26, 17. Whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. So I'm going to leave it alone, and uh, yet we're not going to leave it alone because we already plan to talk about Satan. We already plan to talk about what his influence is in this world, and it just is part of it. You can't talk about the passage without talking about some of the things that are going on. That means you're going to get hurt. That means that there's no way to get in the middle of it without you personally having a problem. And sometimes if there's no way to win, then don't get in the middle of it. I know everybody wants to help, but it, sometimes what we're doing doesn't help. And so some of the things we're going to talk about today are in Scripture that fit, but I want you to realize they're in Scripture. And I'm not trying to make a social comment or anything on anybody else. I know there's evil in the world. I know Satan has been here. And this is about how do we face Satan. Because Jesus did. It is the first thing he did before beginning his ministry. And so I think it's extremely important for us to realize that this is the first thing that we have to do as well. And if we do not learn how to face Satan or how to deal with him, then it's going to be a disaster for a long time. And so I think we need to learn how to do this. So today, let's look at how did Jesus do this. And it's not just a matter of saying, well, I'll follow Jesus and the commands that he gave. If he told me specifically what I have to do, then I'll do that. Now, we're talking about being conformed to the heart of Christ. And so whatever that image is, that's how we want to do it. And so however he faces Satan and works with Satan, that's how we want to do it. And that's following what Scripture is. That's following what the Bible is about. And so the setting of Luke chapter 4 is Jesus has been baptized by John, and immediately, as soon as the celebration is over, the voice from heaven, the dove out of heaven, this is my beloved son, listen to him, and all of that, then he is pushed, driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he's pretty specific. That's what he did in order to be tempted by the devil. It's one of the worst times, I would think, and we usually think of it this way because he doesn't have any food, and he's out there for four. It looks kind of like Arizona, doesn't it? So it looks a lot friendlier to me now than what it used to look. It used to look terrible because, you know, it's going to be hot and dusty and no trees and rocks, and now it seems kind of comforting. That's... Uh, not that bad a place. We've been in wilderness. We know what it feels like. And uh, we're more used to that. And so I think maybe we've got an advantage on everybody else, right? But he goes and there's nobody out there to help him. 
There is no one else out there that can come to his aid or his assistance. He is all alone. And we think of that as a horrible thing. And not only that, but he's about to starve to death. It's been 40 days and no food, and now he's about to starve to death. So what do we do with that? How do we, you know, he's finding him at his weakest time. He's not physically strong. He does not have things to sustain him. And so he's been pushed there. And he says, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Because you need it. Because after all, you're about to die, and it would be a shame for this all to end. And so, as a proof that you are the Son of God, then command these stones to become bread. And that's what Satan is going to use all three times. As a proof that you're the Son of God, well, maybe that's a first clue. Do we really need to prove that? And do we really need to prove that to him? Don't we already know he's the son of God? Does Jesus need to prove when there's no one there that he's the son of God? Why? To himself? Does he have to prove it again when he already knows that it's right? But then what would be wrong with that? Is there any problem with this? Certainly he's got the power to do that. He's going to turn fish into more fish and bread into more bread, right? Right? Uh, he's going to do that for a whole bunch of people, kind of as a proof that he is the Son of God. And so, Jesus is aware of where everything leads. And I think we have to realize that as we go into this passage and look at this. And so, when he talks about turning stones to bread, can he do it? Well, yeah, he can do it. Would it be hard? I don't think it would even be hard. It would be something very easy. So why would he refuse? Why would he not do this? And of course, we understand he doesn't use his power for his own personal safety, for his own personal gain. He is not going to do that, even if it means he's starving to death. And we tend not to understand someone with the power to win who will not use it. Aren't we supposed to use everything at our capability to win no matter what? And the answer is no. Because sometimes it leads somewhere where we don't want to go. We don't understand why someone wouldn't do that. You realize Jesus never does attack Satan. Never does say anything bad about him. I mean, yes, there's a lot of bad things about him, but he never does go on the attack against Satan. Uh, just doesn't do that. He doesn't try to harm Satan. He's too busy doing something good because it's not his place to defeat Satan. That's going to come later. It's going to come at a cross. But let me give you an alternate view of this. So as we've talked about that, that's the way I normally look at this and approach that. But let me give you a survival view of this. If you're really thinking about yourself being in this situation, where would you want to meet Satan? Would you want to meet him here in the church building? Because it gives you an advantage and you've got all the people gathered around. And you could be stronger, right? And you have to think about them. Would you want to meet him in your house with your family all around? Where you're going to go without food for 40 days and 40 nights. And can you watch your child and say, I am not turning stones to bread to feed my child. That might be a whole lot harder, wouldn't it? I think I'll choose the wilderness. You know what? It looks like an advantage to me to not be responsible for anybody else, to not have to deal with anything else, to not have to refuse the care for other people, because I can handle it for me. And so I think it makes sense for Jesus to meet Satan in a place perhaps of weakness, in a time where, yeah, he's starving. But it's just him. It's not everyone. It's not the whole church. It's not the whole family. It's just 
him, and he is able to handle that. And he says, we live by the word of God. We do not live by bread alone. And that's his only excuse. That's his only reason. I don't live for that. In fact, if I take my life, I do not live because I'm about survival. At some point, he knows survival is not going to be most important. And Jesus can take anything against himself. And he does not live by his own safety. And so remember this, the first mistake is to use force with Satan. To win by power, to win by advantage. It will not work. We cannot do it. Jesus does not do it. We should not do it. And so it is never the advantage to win by force or to win by power. Jesus says no. You look at the second one, and the devil takes him, and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I don't know. That, that, wouldn't that be amazing? And so Satan takes him to a different place, to a different location. Uh, let's get him out of there, because he was already able to resist that. Now let me show him the, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. What does this look like? Well, I don't know if he took them to all the ones then that were available and just, you know, fly by. Is that how he shows them? Or is it like on a big movie screen where he's able to somehow see all the kingdoms of the world or realize all the power of the world? And there's one condition, if you will worship me. What he's doing is giving Jesus his goal, giving him his dream, because he came and his whole message was, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I've come to establish my kingdom. And Satan says to him, I can hand you that. I can hand you every single kingdom in the whole world. And you'll have all the power. You can set up your kingdom now. You will have your kingdom now. You have all the power to make it your kingdom now. And you don't have to have any suffering. And you don't have to go through any of this. And just one thing, I just need you to worship me. And so if somebody handed you everything you wanted to do with your whole life, that's what he's being handed, would you do it? That's a big prize, isn't it? Every single thing you've ever thought about doing, but this idea of worshiping Satan. And Jesus knows that the Scripture says, don't worship anything but the Lord God. That's the only thing that we worship. That's the only one that we worship. And I think sometimes we miss how important worship is. As you look at this, it is written, you shall worship. And we want to, you know, get the rest of the sentence in there and say, well, but we don't worship anything else. So, in other words, if you're going to worship, don't worship anything else. That's not what it says. It says, you shall worship. If there's ever a way to show our allegiance to God, it is with worship. Because nothing else says it like that. Like what we've come here today to do, is to be able to worship God. I don't mean sit in a pew, I mean really worship God as if God is important in your life. As if God has some say in your life, as if he's going to control how you're going to do things. And if we are on God's side, then we are going to worship him. We can claim God all we want, but if there's no worship for God, then I think we're just kind of talking in the wind. There's got to be a place, and you can worship Him at home, or you can worship Him here, but your heart is the thing that's important, is that we are there for Him. Well, Satan always has a deal. He can make a great shortcut. He can make a great deal. 
Let me give you no pain, no difficulty, no problem. I'll smooth it all out. Isn't that what we want? You can be rich and famous. That's kind of what he's offering. And the point is, all you have to do is give up honesty and righteousness. That's it. All you have to do is just give up honesty and righteousness. One small detail, you will no longer be holy, you will no longer be pure, and you will need mercy and grace, and you will not be able to give it to anyone. Worth it? And so the principle is this. He takes away what we could become to spare us the pain that we do not want. Would you trade that? And sometimes I think we get to see all the difficulties and all the problems that we are going to face and we say, I just, I wish I had a way out of this. And Satan is right there to say, let me tell you how. And he'll give you a way out. Perhaps you just check out and it's a mental thing or perhaps you use something and it, you're gone or perhaps there's another way even if he could hand you all the kingdoms of the world. What an amazing thing to realize you could have it all. But he takes away what you could become. You will never be anything more than where you are right now. Not to God, not to Jesus, not ever. It's not worth the trade. The last one in Luke chapter 4 and verse 9. He takes him to Jerusalem and he sets him on the pinnacle of the temple. Maybe you think the church steeple. No, it's a pinnacle of the temple. And there is a huge drop off at the wall where the temple was down into the Kidron Valley. It's about 400 feet down. That's a long ways down. It's a long ways as you're looking up from the pinnacle of the temple. And I guess it depends on the different time and where you are and where it would be and all of that. And why are you doing this again? He's even got a scripture. If you do this, the angels will catch you. They'll, they'll bear you up. You won't have to do this. And, and it will prove that you're the son of God. As if I need to prove that again. That, and he keeps saying that. So what happens if we do what scripture said? He's got a scripture for it. And we can just use that scripture, right? Wouldn't it be proof? And many would believe. Certainly everybody who was there and saw him as he went, ah, well, you've got to have the sound effects, right? I mean, how else are people going to know that you're falling? And the angels swoop in and they catch you. And sure enough, you're safe. Isn't that our buzzword for the year? Let's all be safe. Nobody's ever going to do that. What if you could never get COVID again? Right? What would we trade for that? And Jesus comes back with, you will not put God to the test. Put God to the test. Well, did we think he would fail the test? No. God's big. He could pass any test, right? But he's actually not talking here about putting God to a test. It's actually us who is being tested. Don't forget that. Certainly God could send angels anywhere he wanted to, and certainly he could catch Jesus, and it's not that. It's a test of us that we would put God in a position to have to intervene, that he is the one who would have to do that. Okay, listen real close here because I think this happens. God answers prayers. And all we have to do is ask. Why doesn't Jesus ask? He could ask God to save him. 
It would be another situation where he could allow God to save him. And isn't that what it's all about? Is that God would save me and God would save me and God would save me. Isn't that? And no, it's not. It's not while we're here. It's for us to have a relationship with this God. He would save him from danger that he caused himself. Okay? All right? Is that how we use it? When we create our own danger and cause our own problems and we're here for God to be able to save us from our own things that we've caused ourselves, right? And say that that's better. And he says, no. We're putting ourselves in, this, in a situation where, where we are expecting someone else to bail us out. And that's not what Jesus taught. It's not what Jesus lived. It's not how we would be conformed to the image of Christ. He did just the opposite. Let me give you the top view. Pinnacle of the temple. How far do you have to fall before an angel catches you? Is it right at the bottom? Is it about 10 feet down? That might have a lot to do with it. You know, if it's only about three feet, well... Satan wants us to think that God will bail us out. That's the temptation. And Jesus would not use his power when he is in a situation. And he would not create a situation where God would need to save him. It is Satan's greatest temptation to think that God is here to bail us out. And we see this over and over again. It's the attitude of the church. It's the attitude of the people outside of church. I've had people come and, and need money or ask for money, and they're like, well, what do you think you're here for? You're obviously here to bail us all out. No, it's really not. That's really not the purpose. Sometimes that happens, but that is not the purpose. And Satan wants us to think that that's why we're here. Isn't that what God's for? No. It's a role reversal, isn't it? That God is here to serve us because, after all, we know we're sinful. We're going to mess up a lot. So, God, you can just bail us out all the time. And Jesus says, I will never put myself in that situation. We create our own dilemma. Have you seen how kids are working parents? If you've got kids, you know how they're able to work you. They keep track of everything you promise. You know, later we'll go get ice cream. Man, if you didn't get ice cream by 4.30, they're reminding you. You said we'd go get ice cream. I know, but we don't have time right now. But you said we'd get ice cream. Well, I know I said, and it seems like we're that way too. We want to hold God to every promise he's ever made and say, but God, you said we're here to get everything out of God that we can possibly get. And that's the whole purpose and the whole reason. God is a big God. He's got blessings. He's got lots of pockets, lots of money, lots of stuff, and we can get all the stuff for us. Isn't that the Christian way to look at things? And it isn't. And it's not what Jesus was doing. It's like a contest to see how much we can get out of God. And Satan makes it seem like that's why we're here. We're here to get the blessings. We're here to go to heaven. Isn't that why we're here? And if the church does something or somebody does something that doesn't give me what I want... I don't believe in God anymore. Well, I think there's a question about that too. And so as Jesus begins his ministry, he learns not to think that way. He is not demanding his rights. He is not demanding what I can get out of God. He is the one who gives 
to God and serves God with his life, with his salvation, with his leading, with his calling to discipleship. And if Satan cannot convince him of that, he leaves for a more opportune time. Yeah, we face a lot of evil, don't we? And we see it all around us. And Satan is saying, I am not finished yet. And we do see Jesus at the end of his life when Satan comes back. Right? In Luke chapter 22 and verse 47, Satan is obviously back. Jesus is in the garden. He's prayed and his disciples can't stay awake. In verse 47, he says, While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them, and he drew near to Jesus and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, he said, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, and he cut off his right ear. And Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched the ear and healed him. And then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and the elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you today, when I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. And so Judas comes to the garden, right? He's the disciple who's decided it's advantageous to be able to get money for Jesus. And he gives him a kiss. It's already been arranged. It says Satan had entered into the heart of Judas, certainly with Judas's permission. And he is able to control him so that he would give up everything for 30 pieces of silver. And then that's what he gets, 30 pieces of silver. I think Jesus had a much better deal. He was offered all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus said, no. Judas is offered 30 pieces of silver, and he's fine. Jesus says, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Yes, I would. And Peter comes with his solution. We got two swords. Jesus made sure that they had swords, and he's got one. And so violence is the solution to this problem. And he's going to defend Jesus to the death. He is going to do whatever he can. And he gets a little blood. He gets an ear. But Peter, you're only making things worse. And sometimes we get a big mess with blood. It's a whole war. There is a time for violence. But that isn't it. And it's not usually the right answer. Even though there may be a right time. And Jesus cleans up the mess. Puts the ear back on. No more of this. That's his command, okay? No more of this. And it does not happen again, either among the disciples or among his church. Do they ever take up a sword and use violence to get their way? You can read through the rest of the New Testament. You do not see it. It is not a time for violence, not in any church, not in any Bible passage. And Jesus tells Peter, put your sword away. And then to the chief priests and the officers, he says, why now? 
Why are you coming now? I was with you every single day in public. I stood there and waited for you to arrest me, and you did not. Am I a robber? What did I steal? Jesus controlled the time, and he says, now is your time. And I think sometimes we just have to realize that. This is the hour of darkness. This is the time of evil. And Jesus does not resist. And he goes with them. And he makes sure that they know that he is going with them. But that he also knows there's a lot he could do, but he is refusing to. And they know that. And he knows that. And it isn't right, and it isn't fair, but evil never is. And it's going to get worse. You see, the robbers have come. The soldiers have come. And they're to, there to take away Jesus. And to take away everything that Jesus has. And what does Jesus have to say? His main thing is why now? But then he goes with them. It reminds me of Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, and he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. From a thousand years before, it is God's way, and he does not open his mouth. At least it won't be 40 days this time when he faces Satan. It will be three, and Jesus will rise from the dead. And he will walk out of the tomb. And God will use every bit of cruelty and hate that they had to show the righteousness of Jesus and his followers. Because resurrection is glorious, and salvation is amazing, and forgiveness and redemption are shown to be powerful when you do it like this. And it leaves room for Pentecost. When they know the violence that was done was done by them and only by them, and they are responsible for all of the violence done, the grace of God cuts to the heart so that the love of God can come in. And people repented of their sins, and they allowed the influence of Satan to take over them once and no more. They had come to the mob mentality. If there's ever a place in Scripture, this is it, where they had come to the mob mentality and they had allowed it to influence them and they had allowed themselves to act. And now when Peter confronts them with the silence of Christ, it is, what do we need to do? And they repented of their sins, and they were baptized into Christ, into his death, in order to show that Jesus was there for them, and he did something when what he was doing that day. Sins can be forgiven, and grace can be applied, because they had come in contact with the blood of Christ, and that happens when we are baptized into him. It's the only way to get rid of sin and the influence of evil in your life. And it works. It works. It's so huge that it works. There wasn't anything to do at that time, but boy, there's something to do now, isn't there? We couldn't stop the cross, and not that Jesus would even have allowed it, but there is something to do now. And it's not long before... They would face evil again, but they would be better prepared. Because the persecution happens a few years later, and they would be silent like Jesus. 
and they would win over violence. So how do we know that? We know that because you're sitting here today. We know that because the kingdom spread. And if it had not been done that way, it would not have happened. We need to follow exactly who Jesus is. And Jesus can offer forgiveness and redemption and grace to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose that we might be conformed to the heart of Christ. And that's for you today. It's all possible. So today's not a day for silence. Today's a time to act. Would you come while we stand and sing?